Good morning, how's everybody doing today? Some of y'all are good, some of you don't sound like you're doing too well. Maybe today's service will make a difference in your life. Hey, um, what I'm preaching today is not by accident. Many of y'all know I try to do some series, kind of point you in where we're going, that way you kind of have uh, a little bit of an understanding of where we're at. Well, I had an awesome message to close out our series on uh, going past the normal paradigm, being different. And God just absolutely wrecked my world and told me not to preach that and to preach something else. But when that happens, what that usually means is what he's burning on my heart is most needed by someone here. So I know that something I'm going to say is designed for you today. And who that you is, I'm going to guess it's everybody, but there's going to be somebody specifically that God wants this message to go to. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Isaiah chapter number 40. Some very, very um, common verses that you've probably heard. Um, but you've probably heard more of just the last verse out of 28 through 31. <laughs> Many of us probably learned this, uh, learned this verse growing up in church. If we have any church background, you've probably seen it hanging on the wall somewhere before. Maybe it was um, that time you were being drugged through Hobby Lobby by your wife and you hated being there. And y'all can laugh. It's okay. She's not going to hurt you this morning in church. Uh, and you, you've seen this scripture somewhere, Isaiah chapter number 40, verse 31. And I hear it preached on all the time, and it's a great scripture, don't get me wrong. But sometimes I think we forget the first couple verses before it. And I think this is going to speak to you today on this subject. If you want to draw a title down or look at it in your bulletin, is this. Breaking free from darkness. Breaking free from darkness. God told me to speak this and to teach about this today and to preach about this for one reason. There's people here going through some dark times in your life. I got word this week. There's people here that have lost their job. There's people here that in the past week, past month, have lost loved ones. There's people here in the past week, past month, relationships have gone sour. There's people in the past week, the past month, that have heard for themselves or for someone that they love a very discouraging doctor's note of somebody who's sick. There's people here right now in the past week or the past month, you faced a trial financially you never thought you would ever face. And you've let it take you to a place where you are in darkness. It's nothing against you. It's not your fault. But the circumstances and where we're at in life has drained us of where God really wants us in life. I'm going to give you today a couple things called encouragement and hope. Can't we do with a little bit of encouragement and hope in this world today? Come on now. I'm going to preach. I want you all to get with me today. I'm going to preach today on breaking free from darkness. We are called to have life and have life more abundantly. And I believe that Jesus has given us a blueprint and an answer to do it. Let's go to Isaiah chapter number 40. We'll start in verse number 28. I want to read these. I want you to, I just want you to meditate on the words that it says about our God. Hast thou not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord the creator of the very ends of the earth faints not, never grows weary. Can I repeat that again? The everlasting God, our Lord, the very creator that created everything, isn't going to faint and he's never going to get weary. Amen. There is no searching of his understanding. And listen to this. So that man who never faints, he gives power to the faint. Which means we're not God, we're going to get weary and we're going to have times where we're going to fail and our flesh is going to get very, very weak. But greater is he that is in us than he that is what? In the world. The world. Yeah. That's right. So this man who doesn't faint, this God, our Lord, gives us power. And to them that have no might, the weary, he gives and increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. In other words, it doesn't matter how, how robust and young and vibrant you are. There's going to be times you're going to get tired and we're going to fall. And then this verse that you've probably heard many, many times. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. They won't be weary. They shall walk 
and not faint. And all verse 31 does is tie back to verse 28 and verse 29. How do we get to this blank place where we don't get weary? How do we get to this place where when we're faint, we're increased with strength? How do we get to this place when we're at our darkest moment and we can't see light? We turn to God and see Him brighter in our life than ever before. How do we get to that place? It actually starts with, but they that wait upon the Lord. I want to tell you something straight up as your friend, as your pastor, and as your teacher. There's going to be times where answers don't come today. There's going to be time that answers aren't in front of us for tomorrow. There's going to be times we're not going to have the answers for why something happened yesterday. But I don't need to live in my yesterdays and I don't need to live for my tomorrows. I need to trust and wait on the Lord in my todays and He will see me through. Wait upon the Lord. There's three things I think today that will help us. These things are going to help us break free from the very chains of darkness that we have. I'm going to give them to you. I want you to shout. I want you to rejoice because somebody today is going to get a breakthrough in their life. And I believe that. Number one. Number one. How do we break free? We keep fighting. We keep fighting. We don't let the life and the discouragement and the disappointment and the problems and the trials, we don't let that get us down to where we just fall apart and say, I am done. No, we get up and we keep fighting. When the battle seems like it's an unwinnable one, we keep fighting. We're like Gideon when he goes up against the entire army with 300 men. I can imagine the people in their minds said, this is crazy. This is a thousands upon thousands of people that we're fighting against, and we're 300. And Gideon said, listen, God is on our side. You just keep fighting. Let God win the war. we got to quit fighting for ourselves and start fighting to let God win in our lives today. Keep fighting. I want to tell you a story. I've told it before in church, and, um, and it's, it's something that happened back many, many years ago, but I think it's going to help you this morning about this concept of continuing the fight. We were actually at a church in Waynesville, North Carolina. Some of you might know where that is. And, um, and I was about eight years old. My older brother was about ten. And, and in the church, they had a bully. Y'all ever met a bully before? And I'm talking about a real bully. Somebody who's just bigger than everybody else and uses it to their advantage. That's what this kid was. I wasn't as big as I am right now. Now I just want to find him and whoop him just for the past. But I'm not going to do that. But I would do it in Jesus' name because I think he'd be happy if I did it that way. But this big bully always picked and pestered and, and, and just constantly would come up behind you and just smack you on the back or something and run. And he was so much bigger, there wasn't much that you felt like you could do. And, and so after so many times of, of being pushed around and, and, being, and being slapped and just, you know, he was just playing, but it was just annoying. You know how it is. They're, always, they're basically proving how big they are. But one day we were in the kitchen before we were eating supper that night before church. And this big bully just so happened his mom had, had cooked supper for the visiting preacher and his kids. And we're in the kitchen and can't remember what all was said. But he got mad and, and thumped, thumped me on top of the head. And I was about, like I said, I was about 8 years old, 9 years old, somewhere in that range. And he's about 14, 15. He was about 6 foot tall. Big old kid, man. Probably weighed 200 pounds at the time. And I just had enough. You ever been to that place where it doesn't matter what, you've just, you've just had enough? Anybody ever been there before? you just, you just done. And I, I was done. And I looked at my brother and I said, this ain't going to happen to us no more. And I turned around and I kicked that boy as hard as I could in the rear end. I mean, I just hauled off and kicked him. He didn't phase him. Didn't phase me. All I did was made him mad. And when he turned around, he was going to come at me. My brother jumped on from behind and put his arms around his neck. And all of a sudden now, two on one's a little bit more of a fair fight. Hallelujah. <laughs> and boy, let me tell you something. My brother jumped on him and I looked around. I'm like, I'm not going to let this pass by. And all I saw was a long roll of garlic bread. <laughs> Listen, I got street cred for days. I whooped the dude with a load of garlic bread. I took that thing like a baseball bat. Pow! Right across the side of his head. In Jesus' name. I 
took a salad, took a salad that was sitting there, dressing it all, and just planted it right in his face. You say, well, you're not too tough. I was nine. Shut up. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I saw a 14-year-old, six-foot-tall, 200-pound boy get his tail kicked and knew it for the first time, and he started crying. I was like, what? <laughs> he started crying and running off, going to tell his mommy that two little boys had whooped him. And here's the kind of the moral of the story is this. We let ourselves get battered around for too long when we realized if we teamed up and fought with each other, the perception of power is all that needed to change because we had more power together than he had on his own. Some of our problem is we're looking for ourselves to fight and we got a God who's bigger than anything that we're fighting. And if we would trust in God and whoop it together, we'll send the devil packing, screaming and crying, going back to mama. Come on. <laughs> got to keep fighting. We can't just give up. The perception of power changed when we knew who was on our side. Moses said to the people he just led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're walking up to the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his armies are following them. And the people panic and they're like, we have nowhere to go. I can't go forward. We can't go back. What are we going to do? And in that moment they start doubting and said, I have, I have no way to win. I'm lost. I'm done. We're toast. And Moses said to the people in Exodus 14, Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He's going to show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen, you shall see them no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Get God on your side and keep fighting. Don't give up today. Jimmy Valvano, we celebrate it every year in the sports world. ESPN has the Jimmy V week. And he says the immortal, famous words, never give up. Never. Don't ever give up. Keep fighting this morning because you can't break free without a fight. It's going to take, it's going to take a struggle. If you lay down in the place that you're at, in the disappointment and the discouragement, and you let it overtake your life, you let it drown your soul out, you let it become everything that you're about in life, you have laid down and quit fighting. Listen, you are not, you are not this morning determined by your circumstance. You are not who you are based on problems in your life. You have Jesus on your side, and it doesn't matter about yesterday. He will fight for you today, right now. Don't give up. Number two, not only do we keep fighting, number two, we got to keep praising. Ah, oh, this is the tough one, man. How do you keep rejoicing and keep worshiping in God when everything falls apart and your life goes south? You say, Pastor Paul, you don't understand today where I've been this week. You don't understand the tears I've cried, the heartaches. You don't understand the emotions that I've had. You don't understand the past that I constantly carry and the baggage that's in my life right now. Pastor Paul, you don't understand the fights I've had with my spouse this week. You don't understand that the, the, the problems that are constantly overtaking me. You don't understand the job situation and my finances. If you were in my position, you wouldn't be able to say, just keep praising God anyway. I want to take you to a story in Acts chapter number 16. Apostle Paul was out preaching. This girl came up and she had, she was possessed with spirits and the Apostle Paul cast the spirits out of this girl. But the problem was her handlers who were well, actually using the spirits inside of her to make money off of her and what she could do. Suddenly they're out of a job and they get mad because the Apostle Paul has just ruined their income source. And they go to the magistrates of the town and they say, this man's of the devil, we need to lock him up. And they go and they capture Paul and Silas and Bible said they, they did not want them free at all, so they thrust them into the inner prison. And inside an inner prison, they still lock their feet in the stocks. I Many of y'all know what stocks are. You've seen them before. They cut basically two boards, and they cut little, little holes out of each side, just like a little half hole. They put your feet through, put the boards on top of each other, and lock them in together where you can't walk or move. Sometimes they were even stationary to a bench where you just had to sit there with your feet inside them. 
And not only is Paul and Silas doing the work of God, their life has just went south because these prisons wasn't like what we have today. They weren't allowed three full meals a day and all the protections of life. No, the opposite. They're inside prisons that are hollowed out of rock down in the ground. There's water and moisture that drips down the walls. It's moldy. It's mildewed. Human waste is normally ankle to knee deep down in these dungeons because there's no way for anything to get out. And the inner prison was going down to the farthest, deepest depths where you had to go through the, the longest journey to be able to get out. It was basically what we would call solitary confinement of that day. It was down at the lowest level, which means the nastiest of the nastiest stuff had, had traveled its way down to this room. And Paul and Silas, just for preaching the gospel and demonstrating the very power of God, are put into the stocks in this inner prison. And before they had gotten put in, they pulled them out into the town square and beat them. Laid stripes across their back. They're hurting they're broken, they're battered, they're bruised. Physically in torments and anguish and pain. Emotionally wrecked God, in a sense, we're doing your will and this is where we end up. I can imagine, I could not even imagine being in that situation for standing here and preaching today. So I can, Paul and Silas are looking at each other. Imagine they talked a little bit about what had gone on and what the future held. I'm more sure. All of a sudden, Paul looks over at Silas. Silas says, what are we going to do, Paul? Paul said, you know, I think we should start singing. Now, I, I, I'm not a smart man. I'm not somebody who's going to always be sarcastic on everything. But I think in that moment, I would have asked some really pointed questions to Paul about his mental capacity at the moment. Probably would not have been nice. Singing, Paul? I, I, I'm ready to scream some more. My back's blistered and welted open. And you want to sing? And I don't know what song they sang. Maybe they sang, Oh, How He Loves Us. I don't know. But somewhere they started singing. They started worshiping and Silas joined in and started praising God. In a time when it didn't seem like that would be the time to give God glory... For letting you get put in prison and beaten and sitting in human waste. And Paul and Silas start lifting their hands. Their feet may be in stocks, but we still got our hands free. Started rejoicing and started praising and started worshiping regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the darkness, regardless of the pain they were in, regardless of the nastiness of the situation. Paul and Silas start singing praises unto God. And the Bible said when they started singing, there's a great earthquake that happened. And the walls of that prison, the very rocks they were in, started shaking and doors popped open. And stocks fell apart. And Paul and Silas were able to walk out and stood there with all the prisoners and the jailer came running and he sees all these prisoners outside his prison and his first initial reaction was to take his life. The reason being was in those days if a prisoner got out while under your watch you were put to death in the prisoner's place. And here he is standing there fixing to die. And Paul and Silas said, don't kill yourself. Everybody's here. Jesus did this. God just sent this because there's something greater than stocks. There's something greater than darkness. There's something greater than the place that we're at. And there's something greater than what you currently serve. His name is Jesus. And if you ever get Jesus, you don't have to worry about what's going on around you. Let Jesus change everything in your life. And it all started because two men in the darkest situation said, we're going to continue to worship God no matter what. Keep fighting. Keep praising. And number three. The last point is this. Keep crying. Keep on crying. You say, what do you mean by crying? You keep crying out to Jesus. You keep crying out, Lord, help me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I 
Surrender everything. I've got to have you on my own. This is too much for me to bear. Keep crying. Jim Simbola wrote this in his book entitled Breakthrough. The God who delights to show mercy is near, just waiting for us to call on his name. I think about John chapter number 11, the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Jesus had departed out of the town of Bethany and they sent a note to Lazarus who said, Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick, which was kind of amazing because it's God you're speaking to. And, and I think that note would normally say, Lord, Lazarus who loves you is sick. Lord, we, when we pray now, we're like, Lord, so-and-so, they're faithful to you. I want you to heal them and touch them. And this note said the opposite. It said, Lord, he who you love is sick. And Jesus stopped where he was and waited and Lazarus died. He waited two days after he died, then turned around and made a two-day trip back to Bethany. Mary and Martha come running out to Jesus, and they accused him, and they said, if you'd have come when we called, our brother would not have died. Here they are in this dark moment. They're facing a family member who's lost their life. They're facing the rest of their life without him, and, and you know the uncertainty that goes with that. Martha looked at Jesus, though, and she said, right after she said, "Who, if you'd come when I called, he wouldn't have died. Instead of accusing, she turned right, right, right back around, though, and said, but I know you're the Lord. And I called out to you. You can change everything. I know you're still God. Even when you weren't coming, I kept crying. Even when I didn't see you, I kept shouting. Even when I could not find if you had your ear to me, if you could even hear, we sent a note and said, who you love is sick, come back. And even though it wasn't on my timetable, even though I'm kind of angry that it didn't work out the exact moment I wanted it to, you're still God. You can make all the difference in this situation. I'm trusting you. I told this story on our very first Sunday, and I've never told it again. I want to tell it now. When I was young, I was very, very scared of the dark. Like, mucho, mucho scared of the dark, Javi. Mucho scared. Um, and it did not help that my dad always told me stories about this man who had a hideous looking face and lived in a little shack on the other side of the railroad tracks and had a panther that he kept on a leash, a black panther. And little boys that weren't good, he would cross the tracks at night and hunt them down and the panther would drag them back to the shack where he would put them in chains up on the wall until they learned how to be good. My dad has issues. <laughs> I've got issues. <laughs> So every night when it would get dark, all I could think about was Mr. Purple. That was the man's name, Mr. Purple. Please don't go home and tell your kids that story. Mr. Purple would walk around and he'd rattle his chain looking for little boys that weren't good. Well, the problem was I was never a good little boy, so I was always scared of Mr. Purple. So we traveled in a bus and everywhere we'd go, we'd... My dad would fake like a panther would scream, and I would know it was my dad, not still scream. <laughs> Telling you, it ruined me for life and hurt me. But we traveled on a bus all our life growing up. And we were down in, in Mississippi, way down in the south, and it would, we lived out in the woods on 21 acres, and you had to go down about a 500-yard driveway to get to our house. It was just totally surrounded in darkness. There was no light down there except the inside of the house. And you had like a motion light outside, but you had to get close to the door to get it. But well, we pulled in. We pulled into the house one evening about 6.30, 7 o'clock, and we were all tired, so we went into the house and... It was the first time we'd been home in about six to eight weeks. Long time gone. And Dad had parked the bus over about, probably about 40 feet from the house. It wasn't very far. It may not even been that far, to be honest with you. 
And we all got out of the bus and we went inside and got the air turned on and, and you know, made sure everything was straight and the hot water heater on, just kind of making sure what we're going to do. And me and my brother got to play with something. I can't remember what it was. And it came down real, real dark about 10 o'clock at night. And Dad looked at it. He's like, boys, have y'all got your stuff out of the bus yet? And I was like, no, sir. He's like, once you go into the bus, get all your underwear, get all your clothes, we're going to be home for about a week. So we run outside into the garage, and it was me and my brother, and I'm about five years old, six years old. And I, got a, I got a big waste basket. And I go running in the bus, and my brother runs in there with me. It's a 35-foot Greyhound. It was just an old bus. And PJ is older. He threw all of his clothes in the basket, and he goes running out. Well, I throw mine, and I, I'm just, just, just mere half a minute behind him. I throw my stuff in the basket, and I go out, and I kick open that door and realize there's nobody around, and it's dark. And I was like one of those slow motion guys, just like backing up, back into the back into the bus. Like, whoa, wait a second, it's dark out there. So I stood there in the bus, the door's open, it's dark. I'm only 30 to 40 feet away from the door. The motion light, it goes off. It was only like a 20 second light. It's off. I can't get close enough to get it to turn on to see through the dark. And I stood there wondering how brave I was fixing to be. Looked out the door and I'm like, well, I could probably make it. You know, that panther could come between now and that door. You know how many, you know how many scary things are out here in the dark? And you know how it is. You start running through your mind what all the bad things that could happen to you. you know, if I break through that door, though, and that panther hits me, he'll take me 20 feet that way and I'm gone. And I did what every macho little six-year-old boy would do closed the door, went and opened the side window of the bus and just screamed and cried. Hanging out the window, Daddy! Just crying. Daddy, please! Come get me! For over an hour, I screamed out this side window of the bus. I see lights going off inside the house around the corners. They don't forgot about me. I kind of resigned to the fact I might have to sleep out here tonight. That was better than crossing 30 feet and getting tackled by a panther and taken off to a shed and hung up on a wall and chained up. All that's in my mind. And I'm screaming and all the fear about all what could happen to me, Denny, was just pre-playing over in my mind. I can't go that 30 or 40 feet. There's too many bad things. There's boogeymen, there's bobcats, there's pain, whatever. It's all out there. And the problem was, there was a wall between me and my father. But Chris, no matter how hard I screamed, no matter how hard I prayed, no matter how hard I wanted my dad to hear me, it was just a wall. There was something there that I could not reach him. In the state I was in, I was too defeated to possibly fight on my own. You ever been there? So for over an hour, I screamed out the window, Daddy, please help me. To this day, I always remember. Looking up that side window and all of a sudden that door to that garage opens up. You can still see it, man. When that door opened up, there stood my dad, standing on that door. And the amazing part was this, the darkness was still there. All those bad things could still happen to me, but there was something about seeing my dad just 40 feet away. I forgot about the darkness. I forgot about the 40 feet. I forgot about the Panthers. I forgot about the boogeyman. None of that mattered because all I knew was at that point, my father had heard my cry. Amen. And when he heard my cry, it didn't matter how long it took. It didn't matter how many hours I had spent. It didn't matter the tears I had cried. I lost track and did not care. All I knew was in that moment, my dad had heard me and had come 
and said, come to me, son. The darkness doesn't matter anymore. The bad times don't matter. Nothing's going to happen because I'm your father and I'm right here. Can I tell you something? A word of encouragement as we stand today. God is just waiting for you to cry. And he may not answer right now. He may not answer tomorrow. But he's going to walk through that door in your life. You just keep trying. You keep crying. You keep fighting. You keep praising. And God can change the circumstance that you're in. And when he changes it, you're going to be free from all the bondage that you're currently under. That's right. Keep crying because your dad will come to your rescue. I want to say this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed all over the building. Is there somebody here today you say, I'm falling and I feel like I can't get up. I'm drowning in the sea of everything about life instead of the sea of mercy and grace of God. And I want to call out and I'm crying out, God, make a difference in you. I'm ready to get past this. I want to break free. I don't want to live this way any longer. I don't want to live in defeat or shame or agony or any other thing that just wrecks my life. I want to live in freedom of Christ. Is there anyone today, heads bowed, eyes closed all over the building, says, I'm in a struggle right now. But I'm going to lift up my hand because joy is going to come in the morning. Either the lights are going to turn on or Jesus is going to step out. In Psalms 23, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's a dark place. I will not fear any evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It wasn't just good times. That was the bad times when he said that. That was the times when he couldn't see in front of him. That was the times when he couldn't see what the next step would always be. He said, Jesus, you're still with me. So this morning, I want to ask you, if it's you, saying, I, I want freedom. I'm going to keep fighting, keep praying. You don't know my life right now. Not in mercy. I just want you to put your hand up and keep it up. Just put your hand up and say, I need freedom right now. I'm breaking free today. Anybody, anybody else throughout the auditorium, hands are going up all over the place. Anyone else, today's my day of victory. Today's my day of anointing. Today's my day of perception of power is changing. God is on my side. He's fighting with me. He's fighting for me. I'm going to keep crying out. If that's you this morning, I want you to pray along with me. Lord, today we ask for your anointing. We ask for your power. We ask for your strength. We ask for your might. God, we ask for you to lift our weary hearts up. God, take our heads that are looking down and may they look up and see you. May our strength that has failed, God, may you renew it in this moment today. May we walk out here today, God, a renewed Christian with power and with strength and with the might of God in our lives. Lord, in this moment as we fight through the veils of darkness and can't see what's in front of us, may we rely on you, may we trust in you, may we fight with you, may we cry to you, may we praise you, God, and never lose sight of who you are in our lives. Send this, God, we ask that you break us free, God. Take away the shame. Take away the situation, God. Take away all the, the, the negativity that's in my life right now. God, I may have lost a job, but I've not lost you. I may have lost a relationship, but I haven't lost you. God, I may have lost someone I love, but I have not lost you. May we get our eyes up, get them back focused on Jesus this morning. May we praise, may we rejoice, Jesus, for who you are through the good and the bad. It's in your name. Amen and amen. Sing it out with us this morning. I'm going free.